Um, so I'm Anna Tuttle, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Program and Communications Manager for the Institute of Education. And today we have Lindsay Albertson with us, really excited. Um, Lindsay's a new faculty, just came in August to um, the Ecology Department from her postdoc in Pennsylvania at the Stroud Water Research Center. Before that, she got her PhD um, at UC Santa Barbara. And you got your undergrad at, I think, Brown mm -hmm. in Rhode Island. In Providence. What, what, what was your major? Oh, geology, biology. Geology, biology. Mm -hmm. um, um, a freshwater ecologist with an interest in the interactions between the organisms that live in rivers and streams and the transport processes related to erosion and flow. And I just saw a cool video that we're going to see as far as she's doing. Yeah. So um, I'm just going to turn it over. We're really glad to have Lindsay here. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Um, all right. So hi, everybody. Um, many familiar faces here, some new ones. Thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> today I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've been working on coming uh, before I've arrived here at MSU and some projects that are getting up and started. So let's see how this is going to work. Before I get started, I just want to thank my funding sources, which have made all of this work possible to date, including UC Santa Barbara and the natural reserve system there that helped support my PhD work and the Stroud Water Research Center, where I was a postdoc. And of course, lots of people have helped along the way, and I am deeply indebted to them. So today I'm going to talk about two broad research themes. The first is ecogeomorphology, where I link ecosystem ecology and animals that live in streams to processes related to erosion and gravel movement. And the second is the impacts of global change on ecogeomorphic linkages. And specifically today I'll be talking about species invasions related to crayfish and uh, about drought. So. There has been a long history in ecological research focused on the impacts of large-scale physical disturbances, emphasizing the fact that these large-scale physical disturbances, such as tsunamis or volcanoes, drive the abundance, the distribution, and things like death rates of biological organisms. Over the past several decades, we've begun to complement that historical viewpoint that physics drives biology with new paradigms suggesting that biological organisms can actually modify the processes we typically think of as being abiotic. So some classic examples might be a beaver that builds a dam and turns a free-flowing river into a still pond, or termites that turn a flat savanna into a landscape riddled with these large physical structures. And we actually now have a large number of these really cool case studies illustrating the way biology can influence physical processes. So although he's not really known for this work, uh, Darwin's most popular book during his lifetime was all about how earthworms cycle so much material that they essentially create what we think of as compost, but what he called vegetable mold. Wildebeest migrating have been shown to kick up kilotons and kilotons of sediment and can thereby regulate whole annual fine sediment loads in streams. Tamarisk, an invasive plant in the west, has been shown to influence whole channel stream geomorphology and the water table level. And jellyfish have been shown to stir the ocean to a magnitude similar to wind and tide forcing. So we now have a large number of these really amazing case studies illustrating the way that biology can influence physics. And of course, we know that physics can influence biology. And this has resulted in the development of fields like ecogeomorphology, ecosystem engineering, and others that are really at the forefront of a push to quantitatively link interactions between life and its landscape. So this is just a quote pulled out of a recent NRC report, Landscapes on the Edge, specifically calling for a more mechanistic understanding of life-landscape interactions. To do this and to better understand these interactions, many studies have looked at the impacts of ecosystem engineers on transport processes and the impacts in turn of transport processes on engineers. And what I mean when I say ecosystem engineer is an organism that can maintain, modify, or create physical habitat. And we'll walk through a couple examples of these. Um, for my talk today, I'm mostly going to be focused on this link here, the impacts of engineers on transport processes. But we know that these impacts are potentially really important because transport processes, specifically in streams, 
influence everything from producers to consumers to the interactions between them and may ultimately feed back to influence the size and composition of the engineering population itself. So the two broad questions that I'll be addressing and talking about today are, are ecological dynamics important for understanding geomorphological processes? And specifically, I'm interested in parameters related to species, uh, interactions, traits, and of course, density and biomass. And then I'll touch a bit on how global change might impact some of these eco-geomorphological linkages. The first question I'm going to tackle is whether we need to account for impacts of multiple coexisting species and their interactions on physical processes. And this might be really important if, uh, for example, we're in a terrestrial system where we might be modeling the influence of a plant species on erosion. The way we typically do this is to include a tweaking parameter in our model that represents a monoculture of the dominant species in the system. So in this case, it might be a grass or it might be a tree. But we know that the grass and the tree are often in the same place at the same time and potentially interacting. So in this case, the, the grass and the tree might have different rooting depths, for example, and so may differentially influence the water table level or uh, soil erosion rates. And so my question is really, do we need to account for these differences in species traits and their interactions if we're going to accurately incorporate our understanding of biology into physical processes? This question is probably uh, most studied for terrestrial systems. It's less well known in streams. And so um, I'm interested in establishing whether multiple species of animals and streams have importance for understanding geomorphological processes. So I'm going to talk about uh, two model organisms today. The first is hydropsychic caddisfly larvae. I'm going to describe a bit about the life history of these guys and uh, then talk about a series of experiments and models. So caddisflies, um, hydropsychic caddisflies are filter feeders and they build silk nets underwater that they use to pull food particles out of the water column. So this pink arrow here is pointing to silk material draped across gravels. Um, Hydrocycle caddisflies are one of the most abundant and widespread groups of aquatic organisms. So there can be thousands to upwards of 10,000 individuals per square meter. And there can be anywhere from one to five species coexisting in the same stream. And of course, if you're a fisherman, you know these guys because they're uh, fish food. So this is just an image that I took traveling through Wyoming of a van that had a license plate Caddis 1, which I found very exciting. <laughs> so like I mentioned, these guys are filter feeders, and they spin silk webs to pull food particles out of the water column. This is what their silk webs look like. So I haven't done anything to these uh, silk structures. This is actually the mesh structure that the caddisfly builds. So they produce uh, threads and then they weave it into this beautiful, um, almost perfect mesh-like webbing. And like I mentioned, there, there can be thousands to upwards of 10,000 caddisflies per square meter, with each one building a small silk net. So that actually translates to quite a bit of silk in a relatively small area. And as a result, several studies have shown that the presence of this caddisfly silk can increase uh, sediment stability during floods. And this is just a clump of rocks uh, being held up in the air, and those rocks are being held together strictly by silk. So we know that caddisfly silk can have an impact on sediment stability, but I'm really interested in whether different caddisfly species or interactions between them might have unique impacts on sediment motion. So in this system, there's good reason to think that species interactions or species traits might matter. Uh, this is just one example of why. So this is a representative cobble substrate where we might have a fast current over the top and slow current on the bottom of the substrate. And here, these are two distributions of two different caddisfly species. And so the main point here is that different caddisflies can typically be found uh, on different parts of the substrate. And this is the case also at the reach scale. So different caddisflies may be found in different parts of reaches. Not only do they show differences in where they're distributed, 
but they show differences in what type of mesh that they build. So this is uh, mesh pore space size, so how big those holes in the mesh webbing are, uh, across the velocity gradient for two different species, hydropsyche and schematopsyche. And the main point here is that these two different groups of caddisflies build mesh structures that vary in how many threads they have, and thus how big those mesh pore space sizes are. So the take-home point here is that multiple species can coexist in the same stream, and they show real differences in where they're distributed and what type of mesh that they build. And so if you're going to account for the impacts of these caddisflies on sediment transport, these are differences you might need to account for. So to begin to get at this question, I conducted an experiment where I had four treatments of caddisflies. The first is a control with just sediments, no caddisflies present. I then have two species in monoculture, and uh, these are Ceratopsyche oslari and Arctopsyche californica. They're two pretty widely distributed uh, groups of caddisfly larvae, and they're often found in the same stream, and Arctopsyche is about three times as big as Ceratopsyche is. <clears throat> I then have a fourth treatment here that's a polyculture treatment, and for this experiment I held density constant. So my question is whether this polyculture treatment has different effects on sediment transport than the monoculture treatment. This experiment was conducted in replicate recirculating flumes. So each one of these has a motor connected to a propeller that recirculates water. And in each flume, there's a working or test section of sediments where I colonize the caddisfly larvae and allow them to build nets for about four days, which is plenty of time for them to produce their silk. In this experiment, caddisfly density was about 2,000 per square meter, which is well within the range observed in nature. And for this experiment, the surface median grain size was 22 millimeters. After caddisflies had colonized, I ramped up flow to simulate a flood and used an ADV to estimate the shear stress when rocks first started to move across my different caddisfly treatments. And the results I'm going to present to you here are the critical shear stress values in Pascal's across my four caddisfly treatments. And critical shear stress is essentially uh, a measure of how stable the bed is. So the higher the value, the more force you need to get rocks to move. So the control value was about uh, 12, or a little over 11 pascals. Here's what the two species did in monoculture. And there are a couple of key points here. First, on average, caddisflies increase the critical shear stress value by about 50%. Okay, so they increase the force needed to move rocks by about 50%. And second, arctopsyche, that larger species, increased critical shear stress more than ceratopsyche did potentially due to differences in their silk net structures, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But for this experiment, what I was really interested in was what would happen in the polyculture experiment, in the polyculture treatment. So because I held density constant, the additive expectation here is that the expected critical shear stress value will be the average of the monocultures, because there are half as many ceratopsyche there and half as many arctopsyche there. But what I observed was a non-additive increase in the critical shear stress above the additive expectation and above the arctopsyche value for critical shear stress, which achieved the highest critical shear in monoculture. To try to understand what might be happening leading to these unique effects uh, in the polyculture treatment, I conducted a little laboratory trial where I documented where in the vertical substrate these caddisflies were building their silk nets in monoculture or polyculture. So here, uh, this is the sediment water interface, and this is uh, depth within the substrate. And what I'm showing you here is a kernel density plot of the location of their silk structures when these guys were both in monoculture. And you can see that, on average, they built at relatively similar depths, right about uh, 20 to 25 millimeters below the surface grains. What was surprising in this experiment is that they both shifted where they, on average, built their silk structures when they were in polyculture. So Arctopsyche 
The larger species is now building its nest in this sort of top surface layer of the sediments, and Ceratophyte, the smaller species, which is able to fit into these smaller pore space sizes, is uh, building its nest in these lower depths of substrate. <coughs> Suggesting that this spatial partitioning of net structures may be leading to that non-additive increase in the force required to move rock. All right, so to understand how this might be applicable or more generalized to a wide variety of streams, I have developed a, a mechanistic model that adds the binding forces of these catastrophic silk nets to a common model of sediment transport. And I'm not going to go through the, the model here today, but this is the Weiberg and Smith model for non-dimensional critical shear stress that essentially predicts when a single grain, so that's highlighted here in red, will move given the abiotic forces acting on it. Um, so in this image, this line here is the slope of the bed. And for the purposes of catafine nets, I assume that they can build a net anywhere along this area highlighted in yellow where that grain is in contact with its neighbors because they need to attach their silk net um, to things on the side. And Depending on where that, grain, that net is on the grain, it will apply a binding force, FT, so that the Weiberg and Smith um, expression for the non-dimensional critical stress becomes a function of the abiotic forces that they define, which are related to lift and drag, in addition to how many catastrophic nets are there, where they're distributed on the grain, and what the strength of that silk is. <clears throat> So FT, or the tensile force applied by those nets, is defined as a function of the number of individual threads in tension, the tensile strength of a single thread, and the cross-sectional area of those threads. So essentially, the more silk that's there, the stronger that binding force will be. And this can be parameterized for different species, which I have done for my two study species I have already talked about, Arctopsyche and Ceratopsyche. So what I'm going to do is show you guys a, a series of graphs where Arctopsyche and Stratopsyche will be on the x-axis, and uh, a variety of parameters related to their net structure will be on the y. So this is thread diameter, or how thick those threads are. And Arctopsyche spins silk threads that are uh, thicker. They have a wider diameter than Stratopsyche. However, Arctopsyche nets have fewer threads in tension, so they have fewer threads going in each direction, and the, uh, the mesh pore space size of those nets is bigger. And I've actually gone in and pulled on the silk threads to measure the tensile force required to break them. And what I have found is that Arctopsyche, so this is a single thread tensile strength in megapascals, Arctopsyche spin silk threads that are about twice as strong as the Ceratopsyche threads. And even when you account for the number of threads in tension, this is the average net tensile strength uh, in megapascals for the two species. So even though Arctopsyche has fewer threads in tension, the net strength of those uh, silk structures is still stronger. And this difference between species might account for those differences in monoculture and the impacts on critical shear stress that I mentioned earlier. So what I'm going to do now is show you some simulations of this model just to illustrate the impact of these binding forces added to an abiotic model for the non-dimensional critical shear stress. So this is non-dimensional with grain size. So the abiotic uh, prediction is consistent across grain size. And this is a value of about 0.027, which is on the low end, but in the range of values observed in natural streams. And here's what the model predictions show. And there are a couple of key points here. So again, um, Arctopsyche is in green, Stratopsyche is in blue, and the polyculture is in purple. <clears throat> there are differences between the two species, and those are uh, emphasized at about 22 millimeters or higher. On this end of things, Arctopsyche, which is relatively large bodied, has a hard time building silk nets on small grains. And so its effects are severely diminished once you get uh, down to about five millimeters. 
The model also accurately predicts a non-additive increase in the polyculture treatment. And besides all of that detail, the main point I want to show you guys is that the range of grain sizes where these catasphine nets are um, appearing to have a very strong impact is between about 5 to 50 millimeters. Okay, and this range of grain sizes is incredibly important for us as ecologists. It's often the grain size that we use for restoration projects and particularly um, for restoration projects that include spawning habitat for salmonid fish. <clears throat> okay, so to uh, scale this up beyond just the threshold of motion, I've incorporated these changes in critical shear stress into a model of bed load flux using a representative creek. So this is Convict Creek in California. And the model that I've used is the Wong and Parker version of the Meyer, Peter, and Muller flux model. So basically, uh, bed load flux, which is a function of channel width, channel slope, the grain size there, the water depth, and the key variable here is the critical boundary shear stress. And so all I've done is alter that critical boundary shear stress to match the observations that I've made when the catasphines are there in my experiments. So what I'm showing you here is a hydrograph for a representative year, 1992, for Convict Creek. And just like here in Bozeman, it's a snowmelt fed system. So there's typically one large peak and flow that occurs uh, in late spring, early summer. And what I'm going to do is overlay on the hydrograph the predictions of cumulative bed load flux in kilotons <clears throat> according to uh, this model for bed load flux. So here's the abiotic prediction for that control value of a critical shear of around 0.027. And here are the predictions when we alter that critical shear stress value to match those observed um, in my experiments. And there are a couple. Uh, take-home points here. The first is that when catasphines are present and that critical shear stress value is altered, the onset of bed mobility, so the day things get rolling, is delayed uh, from anywhere from five to about 30 days. And not only is the onset of bed mobility delayed, but the total amount of material moved through the system is reduced by anywhere from about 2% to 45%. So just those changes in critical shear stress could potentially have implications for bed load flux over larger spatial and temporal time scales. So um, this is just to give you guys an idea of what I'm working on and some new projects that are up and coming here in Montana uh, related to this Catasfly research. Uh, so this is a map of the Gallatin River watershed and the Gallatin main stem is shown here in blue. And what this is is a uh, prediction of the median grain size, the D50. And the D50 uh, from 10 to 70 millimeters is highlighted in red. So all the streams you see in red are predicted to have a grain size in the range of 10 to 70 millimeters. And uh, this comes from relationships between slope and drainage area. So the plan is to use a two-pronged approach to see whether these impacts on critical shear stress and bed load flux that I've observed in my experiments are happening in real streams. To do this, we're going to do uh, two things. First, an, uh, basically a survey of these streams to see whether our predictions of D50 match to what we observe in the field. While we're out there, we're also going to measure catasphine density and diversity if we can correlate those with a variety of physical habitat characteristics, as well as install bed load traps in a subset of these streams and put out uh, colored rock tracers so that we can document sediment motion in streams that have a gradient of natural catasphy density. The second thing we're going to do is use uh, electroshocking, which is a new technique for me. Um, to manipulate the presence or absence of catasphines. And you know, electroshocking is used all the time for fish, but it's also shown to be successful to stun or kill macroinvertebrates when they drift downstream. And so we're going to couple this manipulation of the presence or absence of catasphines in a small sub subset of these streams 
with a natural survey across the natural range in their density to determine whether these impacts of the catastrophic nets are actually happening in real streams. So this is up and coming in the next couple years. Um, <clears throat> along with establishing the fact that these catastrophic nets do have a relatively large impact on critical shear stress, I'm interested in how these impacts will change with a variety of features related to global change. And one thing about catastrophes is that they are very sensitive to flow and oxygen conditions. So if things start getting bad and flow is reduced, they typically will abandon their silk net and drift downstream. And there's lots of evidence showing that drought directly affects the ecology of catastrophe larvae. What we don't know anything about, really, is what happens to those silk structures when they're abandoned. And so I started investigating what is happening to the silk after it's left during a low or no flow event. Um, so these arrows are pointing to caddisfly nests that are still present on rocks after they have been dried for 14 days. So my prediction for this experiment was that these nets were going to dry out, become extremely brittle, and essentially disintegrate within uh, hours. However, I was extremely surprised to find that not only were they still visible, but they maintained their tensile strength after being dry for 14 days. And this 14-day drying period is only meant to represent sort of a short-lived drought disturbance. It's not meant to represent anything chronic or long-term. Um, like I said, we, don't, we basically don't know anything about these silk structures when they've been abandoned during low flow events. Um, so here, all this is showing you is thread tensile strength, again, in megapascals for nets that were dried out over 14 days and nets that had sustained their ambient wet conditions over 14 days. And there was no difference between the two. So this suggests that if these silk structures are left behind in a stream that's experiencing low or no flow, they may be able to act as a catalyst for secondary succession when flow comes up again. And there's pretty good evidence showing that catasflies will actually recolonize abandoned nets if there's not another catasfly in them. So this is something that I'm going to be working on this summer, establishing how uh, abandoned nets may act as a catalyst for secondary succession. OK, so <clears throat> along with drought, I'm interested in the impact of invasive species on uh, ecogeomorphic linkages. And I've shown you one example where we have coexisting species of caddisfly larvae. What is uh, more typical in, invas in invasions is that we have replacement, so not uh, necessarily coexistence, but replacement of a native species by an invasive species. And the case study I'm going to tell you guys about now is on the East Coast, where we have a pretty common native species, Orconectes lamosus being replaced by the rusty crayfish. And just by these pictures alone, you can see that they have a variety of morphological traits that are pretty different, including their claw size. So rusties are uh, huge crayfish. So you can see this guy is pretty big. They're pretty easily identifiable by the rust-colored spot on the back of their carapace. They are native to the Ohio River Basin. So their native range is shown here in brown. But they have spread throughout the Midwest and the Northeast, probably introduced by fishermen. And as a result, they're having extensive consequences on ecosystems in the areas where they have invaded. And we now have good evidence that rusty crayfish are typically bigger and more dense than their native counterparts. They are better predators, so they do a really good job hammering fish eggs, macroinvertebrates, and macrophytes. And there's some evidence that they're actually less nutritious for fish that eat them. At the same time, we also know that crayfish, and we've known this for a really long time, are bioturbators. And they have a strong impact on uh, the sediments that are in the riverbed. And so my hypothesis here is that rusties might be altering bed topography and structure, the gravel matrix, and potentially turbidity levels and fine sediment levels. <clears throat> so this is what they do. Um, this is actually a video of the native species, or Orconectes lumosus, um, just because this was part of a different lab experiment, so I had pretty good footage of this guy moving gravels around. Um, 
you can see what it's doing. So it uses its claws to move gravels around. And typically, they do this either to forage for food or to burrow and make shelter space. <clears throat> um, one of these gravels, so this is on a loop, and it's sped up. So they don't actually move this quickly. They're, ac they're actually pretty slow when they're moving rocks. But the outcome can actually be quite extensive. So like this rock that it just moved is many times its own body weight. They're capable of moving lot relatively large rocks. And in this experiment, in particular, I had the subsurface gravels colored pink so I could easily visualize how the surface gravels are moved to expose the subsurface. And uh, so as they're moving the surface gravels, they typically expose finer material located below. So we don't know a lot about how these rescues are affecting the physical structure of riverbeds where they're invasive. And to begin to get an idea for how this might be um, impacting the sediment structure, I conducted an in-situ experiment in Valley Creek, which is in southeastern Pennsylvania. <clears throat> uh, this experiment was an enclosure experiment. So I had cages made of wire mesh that either had crayfish in them or they didn't. And the crayfish density in this experiment was 24 per square meter, which is at the high end, but in the range of densities measured in nature. They've been shown to get up to about 80 per square meter in areas where they're basically infested. And I put the crayfish in the cages, took pictures uh, right before the crayfish were put in, and then 14 days later, and measured fine sediment accumulation, gravel mint, which I quantified as the density of pit and mound structures, which I'll show you a picture of in a second, and the percent of the subsurface gravel exposed. And I also measured macroinvertebrate density across my treatments. <clears throat> the first thing I'm showing you here is the fine sediment response. And what this is is, like I said, a picture taken above the bed in a representative control cage and a crayfish cage. And you can see that um, if I place these gravels in there by hand, so it's a relatively loose gravel matrix, but the amount of fine sediment accumulated is relatively similar. And here's what it looked like after 14 days. So I was really shocked by this. Um, huge differences in the amount of fine sediment that accumulated. So this is a riverbed that has the rusty present. And as they're moving those surface gravels around, they're turbating that fine material that's getting pushed up into the flow, and then it's moved downstream. Um, this is what a control cage looked like without any crayfish present. And Valley Creek, where this experiment was conducted, is Sediment impaired is highly urbanized. It receives a lot of runoff from agricultural land. But there are huge differences in the amount of fine sediment uh, exposed after 14 days. As crayfish are moving surface gravels around, what they're doing are creating these pits in the bed. So this is showing you pit structures as a density number per square meter. And a colleague in the UK has actually used a laser to show what these look like. So the blue areas are low elevation pits, and the, brown, the relatively brown areas are high elevation ridges around these pit structures that they create. Uh, so there are a couple of things here. First, in the control, I did the control. I did see movement of gravels. There were two relatively high flow events during this experiment, during that 14-day period. But even given that movement of gravel at base flow, the crayfish effect is overwhelming any effect of the natural uh, flow regime. So significantly more pit structures in the bed when crayfish are present. <clears throat> Same story for the proportion of the bed where the subsurface material is exposed. So uh, they expose, on average, about 10% of that subsurface material. Now, like I mentioned before, crayfish eat macroinvertebrates. And so my prediction was that macroinvertebrate density would be lower in treatments with crayfish present because they'd be eating macroinvertebrates. What I found was that macroinvertebrate density was actually higher in treatments with crayfish present. And I don't actually have uh, mechanistic support for this hypothesis yet, but I believe that the accumulation of all this fine sediment that happened in the control patches 
may have limited macroinvertebrate colonization. A lot of these macroinvertebrates are sensitive to fine sediment pollution and uh, just may not have been able to reach densities as high as they normally would. So the obvious next step is direct comparisons with natives, which I don't have yet. Um, I have an inkling of what's going on from a different experiment. So this is looking at um, the role of crayfish biomass or size in regulating transport and gravel matrix conditions. And in this experiment, I know this picture is pretty bad, but uh, I have small young of the year crayfish. So it's about this big and its carapace length is about 15 millimeters. Uh, so this guy was just born uh, about five months ago, whereas this guy has a carapace length of about 25 millimeters and was born at least a year ago. And you can see that there are huge differences in the amount of subsurface material they expose, or basically their activity moving gravels around. These small young of year crayfish, uh, this difference is not significant, so they didn't have any additional impact beyond base flow conditions, whereas the large guys that are at least one year old have a significant impact on the proportion of subsurface exposed, and this value is right around that 10 to 11 percent of subsurface material exposed by the rusties. So uh, direct comparisons are in the works, although this suggests that their impacts on gravel movement might actually be equivalent. So I've uh, mostly been focusing on the impacts of some representative engineers on transport processes. But the next thing I'm just going to mention, because I don't actually have data for it yet, is the role of transport processes and uh, factors related to flow conditions on an engineer. And that is the salmon fly. So this is work I'm just getting started here. Um, you guys may all recognize this. These are uh, huge, large-bodied macroinvertebrates. This is Terranarsis californica. Just like caddisflies, they have larvae that are aquatic. So this is what the larva looks like. Um, they're fully aquatic. When they're ready, they pupate and they emerge as adults into the air. And when they do this, the fish go crazy. So folks around here have a huge interest in these salmon flies because they're fish food. Um, they're also very sensitive to flow, temperature, and fine sediment conditions. And this is just pulled from a report that Dave Stagliano did uh, with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks in the Montana Outdoors magazine a few years ago. And this is showing salmon fly densities on the Clark Fork River which is one of the only rivers for which we actually have long-term monitoring of salmon fly populations. And you can see that although they appeared to have an increase in their population size in the 1970s, they suffered a severe crash uh, sometime in the late 70s. And we don't necessarily know why, although they're hypothesizing that this might be due to changes in fine sediment load related to flow conditions. And so, uh, I'm going to be looking at this in streams around Bozeman, trying to document uh, their lar larval densities, so what they're doing when they're actually in the stream, and their emergence timing, and their density of emergence hatches. And uh, the way we're planning to do this right now is using bankside mesh traps that catch these emerging adult or, uh, salmon flies as they come out of the water. OK, and you know these changes in macroinvertebrate engineer densities could be incredibly important. And it's not a huge surprise, but what I'm going to show you now is that density and biomass are both related to the ability of animals and streams to engineer sediment conditions. So um, this is the response ratio collected during a meta-analysis. And essentially what this is is just a ratio of some transport process. So it could be erosion, it could be flow rate, in relation to control conditions when biology was not there. And in this particular graph, I'm showing you the results of uh, data collected in experiments that either had high or low density treatments. And uh, this was for, I think it's 48 different papers. And I found that 
the high density treatment in, increase the effect size of that transport process across uh, compared to control conditions. So this isn't a huge surprise that density would have an impact, although one of the first times that uh, we've been able to show that density could be important for engineering impacts. Not only could density be important, but biomass could be important. So what this is showing you is the per capita log response ratio compared to per capita biomass. And there's a positive relationship between biomass and your effect size on a transport process of interest. So um, these things would be things that catalyze things that are small. These guys out here are things like salmon, which are relatively large, that uh, build reds. So on a per capita basis, there's a positive correlation between biomass and your effect size on transport process of interest. However, when we look at the impact at the population level, so this is uh, biomass of the population as a whole compared to the effect size or log response ratio. We did not detect any uh, relationship between the two variables, suggesting that organisms that are small but at a relatively high density have as large of an effect on engineering processes as organisms that are big but at low density. And of course, to further complicate the story, we have species that destabilize and stabilize sediments. Um, so this is just showing you the number of species that were studied that destabilize or stabilize sediments. So what I've talked about today, these destabilizers might be things like crayfish that bioturbate the sediments. Stabilizers might be things like caddisflies that bind things together and stabilize the riverbed. Uh, in this Meta-analysis, we found that more species were studied that destabilize, and that could either be uh, the reflection of the author's interest, or it could be that more species, in fact, do stabilize, destabilize, I'm not sure. But interestingly, their effect size on whatever pr transport process was being studied was uh, not statistically different. So stabilizers and destabilizers had relatively equivalent effects. To summarize here, um, you know, we now have a large number of these case studies illustrating that biology can influence physical forces and vice versa. And so what I'm trying to do is start to uh, sort of pick apart the influence of all of these ecological dynamics on transport processes. And those, of course, are very complicated as well um, to better understand how species law, changes in species distributions, et cetera, might be influencing these ecogeomorphic linkages. And with that, I'll take questions. Thanks for listening. Yeah? So this bed stability, when you put the two species together, they make it more stable. In my hypothesis is that when, you, when they're together, Mm -hmm. The uh, smaller one colonizes the lower area. I think that makes sense. Yep. And it forces the larger one into the surface. Mm -hmm. And the more rope in the surface makes a lot more difference than rope in the, in the, uh, in the relatively immobile lower layers. I think that's a reasonable hypothesis. I will say that these guys are aggressive. They're really territorial. They'll fight to the death. And usually the larger bodied species are competitively superior. And so it's more likely that they're relegating that smaller species down to deeper depth. However, the outcome of that may be that now they're concentrated in that surface layer, and that's what's getting stabilized. However, um, I don't have a good answer for you yet about how to distinguish that, so I have not mapped out sort of networks of nets. But it may also be that now those surface <coughs> nets are tied to lower layers, and the effective size of that grain that would be moving is larger. That makes sense. Do you think you could stain the nets differentially? 
So you can stain the nest. I don't know that you can do it differentially by species. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah, the best thing I've come up with so far is to use these little, they're caddis farms, like ant farms, that they're skinny, and they're only one grain diameter wide, so I can visually see who is where. Um, it would be cool to be able to stain them differentially. I'm not sure that you can. But you could at least stain them um, together to illustrate that now there is quite a bit of silk concentrated in the top. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in the experiment where you saw lower densities of macroinvertebrates where the crayfish were doing bioperturbation, uh -huh. did you also see a shift in the community structure? No, no difference in richness. But, but was, it, was it the same species? Same species, yeah. So in that experiment, Hydrocycidae and Gamerus was, were the two abundant macroinvertebrates that live in that stream. And they were both in both treatments. So no difference in richness. Same species were there, just a big difference in density. Hmm? Uh, with respect to the sort of first step, material you presented this mm -hmm. idea of um, sediment transport studies. Mm -hmm. I guess that what's occurring to me is, you know, hydrocycony and these other guys have been present, mm -hmm. present ubiquitously throughout the West, for instance, where a lot of that sort of sediment transport work was done. And I'm just thinking about bed mobility studies and high thresholds of motion and stuff that have been recorded empirically over decades and decades of work basically are implicitly incorporating this bed strength that's there from these guys. And so I guess I'm just thinking about like teasing out their effect versus no effect it seems like it could be a challenge because a lot of the data out there sort of implicitly incorporates their effect. <clears throat> Does that make sense what I'm asking? Um, if, I, if I go out and do studies mm -hmm. and this bed load transport in systems that have these organisms, uh -huh. sort of incorporating their yeah. So teasing it apart seems like it would be challenging. I agree. Um, and I would say I'm coming at it more from the angle of when we come up with these transport models, like the Weiberg and Smith model, which is widely used, it doesn't have a biological term in it. And not only does it not have a biological term in it, it doesn't account for species traits. When it, species traits clearly matter, and density matters, and biomass matters. And so starting to delineate when those things matter and when they're completely overwhelmed by the physical uh, forces so that it wouldn't matter that you measured catafly density or something like that is what I'm interested in doing. And I'll also say, you know, that there are, there's a range of grain sizes out there where crayfish probably don't matter for sediment transport and catafly's don't matter. And what I'm interested in doing is trying to delineate that threshold where you cross over. Yeah, Bill. Kind of follow up on here. Um, I know across the urbanizing gradient, we can a time when those species are especially mm -hmm. and, uh, and then there's also the compound effect of flashiness and flows and, and increased fine grain size. Mm -hmm. Other things. But, uh, uh, it seemed like there's a, there's a point across that gradient where those species don't exist. Yes, absolutely. And they don't exist everywhere. They're, they do exist in the majority of streams. You know, hydrocycids are pretty much any stream you go out and sample, you'll find them. Um, but they aren't everywhere. And they also show, you know, real differences in when they're emerging as adults, too. So even though multiple cohorts can be present in the stream at the same time, they vary even within a species and their body size and the type of silk structure that they're building. So there is potential, you know, if you were to go out and measure sediment transport at a time when all of the caddisflies, or most of them, are in the air as adults, you would miss that biological effect, potentially. Cool study. Thanks. So these are model where you incorporate the biological mm -hmm. influence on shear stress. There is a point where the bed becomes mobile. Mm -hmm. The shear stress has to get higher for that to happen, but there's theoretically this dead mobile 
It doesn't right now, and um, or actually, it might. And I think the threads are just broken. But what's probably more realistic is that the threads stretch first, and we haven't come up with a way yet to include elasticity in it. So everything I've been doing with the tensile strength is just pulling the threads to break, but they're actually elastic, um, and we don't have a way to account for that yet. Back to a physical transfer. Yes, completely physical. Right, and so does your, does your model, I mean, when you're calculating change in sediment transport, the delay it, makes sense to me. Uh-huh. But I'm really surprised by the change in magnitude because hmm. I would expect that stream bed to revert back to uh, pure physical. And in the model, it does, and it yeah. reverts to a purely physical okay. response then, and uh, you still see those yeah, huge yeah. reductions in bed load flux. Yeah, there are a bunch of spider web studies. Spider silk is stronger than caddisfly silk, if um, that matters. Yeah, yeah. So they have done comparisons across, uh, you know, these broad groups, and caddisfly silk ranks on the low end of silk strength in nature. Um, I relied on, so people are sort of interested in caddisfly silk because it's a material that's functional underwater. And so there are biomedical groups that study it potentially for like surgery purposes. And so there are some textile and medical uh, papers out there that publish on caddisfly silk tensile strength and whether it's sticky or not and things like that. Um, less so on the ecological side of things. The bottom of your diagram had consumers and producers in it. Mm -hmm. What do you think that uh, this is doing to photosynthesis in the system? That would be pretty easy to measure. Yeah. And I think that just again to try hypothesizing, mm -hmm. uh, if you got sediment accumulating, that's not good for photosynthesis. Uh, so. That's something that we're actually going to be measuring this summer in experiments. Um, whether metabolism and biomass of producers is different when you have caddisflies there, um, potentially due to two mechanisms. One is related to the rocks rolling or not, and the other is the presence of the silk itself. Um, like I mentioned, it might speed up secondary succession for macroinvertebrates, but it also might for diatoms because it is something up in the flow catching you know, new colonists coming um, to a previously disturbed area. And so we're going to be testing that exact question this summer. So the impact of the silk itself and of the change in mobility on biofilm, biomass, and metabolism. you think diatoms colonize the silk itself? They might. I think they do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know about in front of the net, but they tend their actual silk religiously. So if it gets too full, they will do crazy things like actually cut out holes so that more flow can pass through or remove silk threads. I mean, they're... They're amazing. So I don't actually know about the path in front of the net. That's interesting. But they do tend their actual silk structure all the time. And they're very invested in doing that. Yeah. How big is the structure relative to the fly? Is it much larger? Um, it's about the same size, actually. So I would say a centimeter squared area. So the, so the single nets themselves are pretty small. They're about as big as the bug is. But um, there can be thousands in a square meter. So they're incredibly dense. And they repel each other. So that means it's a nice, thick, uniformly dense network 
of men. Yeah, they um, will. Here, I have a slide actually. Oh, this is, hold on. And these are like other things in case people ask me about it. So this is, uh, I collected a bunch of caddisflies and in a bucket. And this is what it looked like when I sorted through that sample. So each one of these is a caddisfly. And it's amazing how regularly they will space themselves. They'll do, I mean, this is just a bucket that had a bubbler in it, but they'll do this on rocks as well. They'll spread themselves out with just enough room that they're happy and that their neighbor's happy. That probably tells you how big the networks are right there. Mm, yeah. From, from an ecosystem perspective and modeling would you care to speculate about phenological changes? So, I mean, we're looking at earlier runoff mm -hmm. potentially. So then you're dealing with a younger cohort mm -hmm. of data. Yep. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that the smaller ones do tend to build smaller nets, so there's less silk there. Um, there's potential that that disjunct would reduce their impact on sediment transport um, if it's occurring sooner. Um, I, I think we're hoping to capture some of that with our field experiments, because we'll have sediment tra traps out there leading up peak flow. And so we'll be able to see how many rocks are moving and you know the volume of rock that's moving. Um, I guess I was even wondering, if, is it again, on, on the other side, is it a threshold thing uh -huh. that if it's early enough, then there's a potentially, we hit a point where there's much minimized effect. Of the, yeah. Of the catastrophe, not just a linear. I would say it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Bill. Well, to your basal species stuff. Mm -hmm. I was at a meeting, SWS meeting, and a bunch of people from the US were talking about the apocalyptic level of invasive earthworms, which I had no idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if you think about when you reach these apocalyptic levels, like Didymo, uh -huh. how does that interbubble uh, out your relationship? Ah. You're in base stuff with the crayfish. With the crayfish. Like, do they reach like epidemic levels? They. They do, and they can, and um, that is the case in Europe. And I have a colleague in the UK who studies invasive crayfish over there who, um, I mean, they're just totally infested. And he's demonstrated that you can actually see diel pulses of fine sediment at night when the crayfish are active at base flow. So there's nothing happening to the flow. It's just crayfish activity happening at night. And he sh has shown that in the field which I think is really cool. Um, you know, the other thing about the invasives is that we spend a lot of money on removing them, and crayfish are certainly no exception. We spend a lot of money removing them, and uh, it's really hard to do. It's hard to get them all, and so I think there's some questions about whether it's worth it and, you know, how we can more effectively spend our money. Yeah. Yeah, eat them. <laughs>